Hello, everyone, and welcome to EU's first live event. For those of you who aren't present with us today but are present on our campuses in Geneva, Montreux, Munich, and here in Barcelona, you can take part by tweeting your questions or comments with hashtag EU Peter Brabeck. And now I'd like to welcome to the stage EU Business School President, Dr. Dirk Crane. Dear guests, dear students, and all the ones who are on stream live with us this afternoon. I have a special guest for you today to introduce you. It's a man who influenced my life also. With some kind, with some art and, and strong words. First of all, he is a visionary. He is a strategic doer. He is an achiever. In everything what he makes, he wants to win. In Switzerland, we believe that Helmut Maucher was a top CEO, and he was a top CEO for that area of the time of the economy. But when Peter Brabe came on board, the first two years, he was observing, working, going with the flow of Nestle, and then in one of the meetings, and I was impressed by the, that word, he said, it's time to accelerate. And that means accelerators are winners. In everything what he touched in his company, he made a gold medal. We are honored to have you, Peter, here with us today because you are not only a CEO, a chief everything officer, but also a guy who inspires young people, who inspires his employees. And these are more than 330,000 employees worldwide. Nestle is a market leader in several uh, markets. He was the visionary to say, we accelerate with water. He was the guy in an interview with me who said, Dirk, in the next five years, look to Africa, demographic growth. Two million new consumers are coming up to us, billion. Huh? So with other words, he inspired a lot of people and I'm honored that you are today with us, that you, in can, that you can inspire this young generation and I give the floor to you, Peter. Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Dirk, for this invitation, the European uh, Business School, with, whom, with which I have a very long-standing relationship. I had my son going through your school, and I must say he does very well afterwards, so I think this is a good augur for all the students here in Barcelona and everywhere else. I was asked to talk a little bit about a book that I have written, which is called Nutrition for a Better Life. And people are asking me why you have written this book. And there were basically two reasons for that. The first one was I was really uh, become worried about the image that especially young people like you, the millennials, have about the food industry. It seems that we are responsible for all the bad things in life that are existing today. And I wanted to give a look at the journey through time of the food industry, but also a look into the food industry and to show you that uh, perhaps the role that the food industry has played in your life and in the development of humankind uh, is perhaps much more positive than what most people believe. And the second thing was I wanted also to show people what is in front of us, what is uh, the vision that I have for the food industry and where it can take us. So, Come with me on a short uh, journey through time and uh, into the future of the food industry. I think it has become a well-known fact that food intake is closely related uh, to health and to wellness. This, I think, most people today recognize. So good food is the base for good life, to make it simple. And if I look back in the journey, there was, of course, in the beginning, there was paradise. 
and paradise was the time when the uh, happiness uh, quotient was very high, the IQ was very low. That's why they were so happy, frankly speaking. And of course, in paradise, there was no need uh, to cook. Uh, cooking only came after we have been expelled from paradise, before we didn't have to cook. And why we were expelled from paradise, it was all an issue of a nutritious apple. So even nutrition played the role when we were expelled from paradise. But it started, the moment we were expelled from paradise, we started to cook. And cooking is the art, technology, and the craft of preparing food for the consumption with the use mostly of heat. And in other words, we need fire. And fire, if you go to the Greek mythology, of course, was brought to us by Prometheus. I should make a picture because uh, here you can see first paradise and then afterwards uh, the, 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 the fire issue. It was brought for us by Prometheus who gave fire to the humankind according to the mythology and Zeus was so angry because Prometheus has given fire to the people because it allowed the people to become independent from the gods. It allowed the people in order to develop intellectually and physically. And he was so angry that he decided to chain him, to see on this on the other chain, to chain him into the big rock in Caucasus and to have an eagle eating his liver as punishment for having given us the fire. Now, if you look back, if you talk to anthropologists, you will see that uh, fire was used by our forerunners already about 1.8 million years ago. If you go to the Wonderwork Caves in South Africa, you can see the first time fire in, 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 in paintings. That was about a million years ago. And in Europe, we used fire about 250,000 years ago, quite commonly already. Basically, uh, cooking involves the manipulation of the chemical properties of natural ingredients which contains various amounts of molecules, and the most important ones, of course, are the proteins, uh, the carbohydrates, and the fats. And additionally, we find water, we find micronutrients and minerals, like salt, for example. Why do I make so much emphasis in, in cooking? Because I think there is a little bit a wrong, I would call it the fat just by now, that you shouldn't be cooking if you want to uh, nourish you very well. Well, I would say most probably it's the contrary. It is just because we are cooking that we have been able to separate clearly from the animals. Animals don't cook. Animals don't use fire. Only human beings are cooking and are using fire. And why it is so important? Very simply, firstly of all, it prevents many foodborne illnesses that would otherwise occur if food is eaten raw. By heating, as we all know, harmful uh, organisms like bacteria and viruses, as well as various parasites, such as dead worms, for example, are killed or at least inactivated. So safety, safety of the food is extremely important when we're talking about cooking. Secondly, it makes many food digestible. We are not aware that, for example, grains, we wouldn't be able to eat grains if it was not cooked or some of our food, which is so nicely being said, if you all eat all natural, well, if you would be all eating natural, you would be dead. For example, potato. If you eat a raw potato, it's highly toxic, okay? If you eat, for example, a kidney beans, which in Spain is very much liked, well, if you eat it uh, raw, it's highly toxic, you might die on it. So again, cooking plays a very important role, and certainly, Cooking facilitated a first way to store and to transport food. And that was a sine qua non so that we could build the first settlements and we could build the first small cities. Then afterwards, of course, food had also a lot uh, of religious importance and also a lot of cultural importance. And over the last couple of years, I would say even cultural na or nationalities have been defined by food, and we could talk about this, but I think let me move forward just to show you the situation before the food industry was really born.
due to the very limited shelf life, what I said before, most food was locally produced and there were only very few products, basically I would say spices and tea. They were the only ones that were traded before there was a food industry. The agricultural output was very low due to the lack of fertilizers, plant protection, things like this. And food preparation was limited to very simple technologies like grinding, the, 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 the grains mainly, and baking. And there was a limited usage of preservatives in order to keep a little bit the, the, the products longer, and this was basically salt and sugar. If you think about bacalao, very famous here in Spain, it's a salted fish. Why they salted it? Because otherwise it would have been rotten from the ship when it was caught down to come into the place where it was eaten. And sugar, because if you're thinking about marmalades and jams and all of the stuff, what you're doing, you're adding sugar in order to preserve it. So as a consequence, most food consumption and food production was for home consumption. And the urbanization, and that's a very important part, the urbanization was limited basically to the amount of people that could be fed by the farmers who brought in the morning on an ox cart their fresh products to the market. And that was about the radius of 15 kilometers. So a city could be as big as the surrounding farmers could create food for the city. And that's the reason why we had so many small settlements, but many, many of them, because that's what could be supplied. And food poisoning at that time happened very, very frequently. We know, of course, about cholera. We know about pests who had wiped out. Up to 25% of the European population was wiped out in one attack of pest. And if they were not killed by pest and cholera, then many starved by hunger due to the very low agricultural yield per hectare per farmer. So it is not surprising that the life expectancy in Europe in 1800 was 30 years. If I look around, even with all your students, we would be very few who would still be here if we have a life expectancy of 30 years. Now, the greatest human desire has always been to lead a long and a healthy life. But I don't think that 30 years is a long life. So as you can see from the chart, quite interesting, that due to the fact that through the influence of the food industry, we were able to supply more calories, just more calories to the population, the life expectancy of the same population increased from 30 years up to about 80 years in a period of not even more than 200, 200 years. And uh, the success was, to a large extent, possibly to, thanks to the more delivered calories and also a more diversified choice of healthy food. Now, you can see on this chart that this was a paradigm, very important paradigm, which justified the food industry. It was the main task of the food industry to bring more calories to the population, and by that they would increase the life expectancy and would assure to have a longer life. And science, industrial research, and development played a key role in the early development stage. And if I just mention a few examples just to give you a hint, for example, in 1804, the Parisian pastry master and confectioner Nicolas Appert, he created a new conservation method by heating uh, food in hermetically closed uh, bottles and glass jars. Well, your grandmothers, at least mine and my mother, they still used this in order to make compote and to, to, to preserve the fruits. Now, in England, in some years later, the French merchant Peter Duran invented the first can, a metal can, and we are getting canning as a big industry technological breakthrough. In 1857, Louis Pasteur, he invented pasteurization because he realized that by heating food, he would be killing a lot of the bad germs and pasteurization today for us is a given. There was another gentleman, Justus von Liebig, who was neither an industrialist nor a merchant, 
but he was just a scientist. And what he was doing, he, he steamed prose into it. on the daily menu of all soldiers in the Second World War was an invention by him how to, how to use this meat, which nobody knew what to do about it. And so were many others, Julius Maggi, uh, a Swiss one, and of course, Henri Nestlé, who invented the first infant cereal, which saved millions of children uh, uh, of starving babies. But then, let me move forward, and that was 1995. Uh, I became CEO in 1996. It was announced by 1995. I had to look around, and I was trying to find out what is happening in our industry. And then I realized that there was suddenly a change, a paradigm change, a 200-year paradigm change, which had happened very silently, without big mess about it, and that was that for the very first time, if you gave more calories to your consumers, life expectancy did not increase anymore. It could even go down. And this changed the rules of the game completely for a full industry. And very, very, very few people, I must say, were about, were, became aware of this paradigm change. And for a company like ours, when I became CEO, that was the reason why I said from the very beginning, our task now is changing from a quantitative approach, which was even more calories at a lower price so that more people can have access to it, to a qualitative approach where we have to sell better calories. And this is the reason why I decided that I wanted to move the company from a food and beverage company into a nutrition, health, and wellness company. That was the analysis, and that was the chart which you can see here uh, laid out. Now we have moved on, and uh, we are now in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which Klaus Schwab, uh, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, argues that this revolution is different in scale, in scope, and in complexity from everything we have ever seen before. What is happening is that the range of new technologies are fusing the physical, the uh, digital, and the biological worlds. And these developments are affecting all disciplines. It is affecting economies, it is affecting industries, it is affecting government. And I dare to say it's already affecting how we think about what it means to be human. I was the other day looking uh, at, the, at the video where a man without hands, without legs, was climbing the north face of the Grand Chima and the Dolomites. Okay? And the interesting was, thing was that he was faster than anybody else who had his arms and his legs. Because, of course, thanks to the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the performance level of artificial legs and artificial hands is much higher than the one that we have. Now think what this can mean for the future, okay? So I think this will be the, 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 the most important question later on, what, what it still means to be human, when we are stopping to be human beings, when we are going to be cyborgs, or when we are going to be, I don't know, perhaps part of a machine. But in all industries, digital and technologies have created new disruptive ways and of combining products and services. And so it has also done, of course, in the food industry. They are today, the food industry is in a crossroad into two different ways how to take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution. 
I will just mention it without going into details. Perhaps afterwards, if you have questions, we can go into more details. But I would call it, there is a 3G way to go, which I'm sure you are aware uh, about this private equity company who has been revolutionizing the industry by using the new technologies in order to diminish drastically, dramatically, the costs of production and improving the operating margins short term substantially. So we're talking about improvement of operating margin between 700, 800 basis points, and that's enormous, okay? So I told in my shareholder meeting that those people who have a high esteem are really pulverizing the, the, our, our, our industry. They are changing the paradigm. There's only one hiccup with this thing. And I show you only the part of the, uh, which was a first uh, endeavor, which was creating a superpower in the brewery and in, 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 the, in the beer industry. The issue is that by concentrating and squeezing out the costs, they are not able to increase the volumes of the businesses they are. They are not creating businesses. This is a financial model which increases short-term shareholder value. As you increase short-term shareholder value, you get a higher market valuation. And in order to grow internally and to grow the industry, the next step you have to do is to buy the next company which is bigger, and so you go from one to the other. And I think uh, anybody who has been looking two weeks ago what has happened uh, in uh, the attack on Unilever, well, this is the same group who is now trying to do the same thing in the food industry. So this is one way to go. The other way to go is, of course, to use and to grasp the many extraordinary opportunities the Fourth Industrial Revolution offers us to tackle significant long-term challenges for humanity in order to offer a safe and healthy food security and therefore create sustainable long-term growth and profit. And let me show these two uh, ways just graphically because, I mean, we are in a university. Uh, one is, I'm sure you are aware of the Engels curve, at least those who have been studying economics, they know about it. And you can see that you have two options. which is uh, today in the United States, even before Obamacare, uh, taking 16% of GDP, 
which goes into health cost increasing every single year, it's quite clear that this system is not sustainable in the long term. I always call it we don't have a health care system, we have a sickness care system, because it only starts to tackle when you are sick. As long as you are healthy, you are never part of a health care system. It's very interesting. I think in order to overcome this, we will have to talk more about how we keep people healthy in the, in the longer term and not how we treat them when they are sick. Let's try to avoid that they are becoming sick. So it's very much about strengthening and extending the role of science-based, personalized, resource-efficient and sustainable nutrition to further advance towards the goal of uh, people to live along at a healthy life. And it's quite clear nobody can do that alone. This cannot be done by the food industry alone. It needs, of course, a medical part of it. It needs politics. So all together, food industry, science, politics, individual. But let me perhaps in the last few minutes, before we open up for discussion and question, give you only one example how we see Nestle's role in this challenge. And the one example I would take is chronic diseases, because I think this is now the number one killer. It has overtaken uh, cancer as number one killer. So it's very important to understand the basis of chronic diseases. And there are multiple factors, as you can see. There are external factors, and on the external side, diet and nutrition plays an enormous important role for chronic diseases. You have the environment, very clearly, if you are in a polluted air, that will have an impact on, on, on your health. And you have the lifestyle, which is another part of it. If you are just sitting eight hours or ten hours in front of a screen, uh, well, uh, your health situation is different than if you have a more active life. Uh, on the right hand side, on the other side, you have the internal factors. They have to do with your genomics which we can now analyze very easily and uh, very shortly. Uh, the epigenomics, which is the part that is the external influence on your genetic upsetting. The age, there is a difference between uh, if you are just a baby being born, the first 1,000 days of their life, or if you are middle-aged, or if you're an older man like myself, our demands for nutrition are completely different. And then our metabolism, which is another area where we're only starting by now, but we shouldn't forget we have about two and a half kilos of bacteria which we are carrying in our digestive system. We have about 750 grams of bacteria which we have on our skin, which we all have to feed. And what we are learning now more and more is that those bacteria have a much bigger influence on our brain than what we ever have thought. So many people are becoming, for example, overweight, not because they don't have the mental will in order to not to eat. They are being demanded by their bacteria uh, from the stomach. Those bacteria wants to get more of this and this and this food. So this is a completely new area that we are starting to understand better and better. So we see the role of a nutrition, health, and wellness company predominantly in the area of promotion of health and the prevention of disease. What I said before, I think the only way that we really have a sustainable health system in the future is by preventing to become sick. And you can, uh, in order to do that, we had, of course, to understand uh, more about uh, all the life science part of, of, of uh, of uh, our, our bodies, and therefore we have created a new life science research center, the objective of which is the understanding and the modeling uh, health through creation of biological inter interrelationships of diet, genes, lifestyles, and then the resulting cellular phenotypes, which are the proteomes or the lipidomes or the metabolomes, to elucidate this continuum of health to disease. If we can get a grip early on, as you can see on the chart, if we can get a good grip early on on, on this uh, continuum from health to disease, we can hopefully help that disease comes later, 
and then hopefully we have a longer active life and then hopefully also a shorter death. Well, when one has to say it, it's, uh, that, that's really what one wants, you know. Uh, you want to live longer, but you want to die in three weeks and then it's over. And not, uh, not to live uh, up to 19 years and having the last 20 years in a wheelchair and, and, and demands and Alzheimer. That's the difference between one approach and the other approach. So the principal areas of research of the Nestle Institute of Health Science are basically brain health, which has to do with dementia, with Alzheimer I was discussing. It has to do with gastrointestinal health, as a nutrition company, of course. I talked about the microbiome, the influence it has in, in, in your life. The metabolic health and aging, for which we have created these multidisciplinary science platforms. And um, this is only a glimpse. I'm not going to go into all the responsible but what I think a responsible nutrition health and wellness company will be able to deliver. But I think, even though this is a glimpse into the future, as a responsible company, we had to act immediately today. And this is the reason why we have reformulated, a, up to now, 84% of all of our products that exist. And we ha are selling every day 1.1 billion products every single day, 1.1 billion products. 84% of those have been reformulated by eliminating hundreds of thousands of tons of salt and sugar and fatty, trans fatty acids, applying modern food technology so that we have healthy products, every one of those that we have. We still have 16% to go, which we are working very actively on them. And on the other hand, we also didn't take only away those which are not good, which is not so good. We also enriched those are good. And there we have been enriching about 200 billion, last year, 2016, 200 billion of servings of products which were fortified with iodine, iron, vitamin A, zinc, and others. So feeding a population that will grow to about 10 billion of people in a sustainable way and assuring at the same time that our products become door openers for what I said before, for a long and healthy life. This is a great challenge. But I hope you feel that this is also a great and fantastic opportunity for long-term sustainable value creation for our shareholders. So ladies and gentlemen, I know my journey through time and into the future of the food industry was very limited. It was just a, a little bit an aperitif. It was an hopefully and an eye-opener, and uh, I know that we will have time, and I was asked to let sufficient time for questions to answers, so let me stop here saying that, as I mentioned before, if you really want to know more about this topic, you can always read my newest book, Nutrition for a Better Life, A Journey from the Origins of Industrial Food Production to Nutrigenomics. And now I'm open for any question that you might have. Thank you very much. I don't, yeah, there's a, a microphone. Uh, yeah, you need some light, that's better. Here, down, yeah. well, okay, one up there. Uh, hello, sir, uh, thank you for coming. My name is Konstantin, and uh, I have a few questions regarding the quality of food. Um, we know that conventional farming is the most productive, but we see through the time that it takes a lot of land and it takes a lot of resources to maintain conventional farming. But we also know that innovative forms of farming like organic farming or polyculture um, are way less productive but better for the environment. And as you said, there are two ways. Uh, we either increase the production of food or we increase the quality of food. But as a students, uh, I personally want to know, how it is in the highest level of business um, initiatives. What are the businesses thinking towards? Do they think it's still conventional farming or they start switching towards organic farming or other innovative methods? Yeah, I think a very, very relevant question, a very important question. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that the 
way we are producing food today is not sustainable, very clearly. Yes. And uh, that, of course, is a big issue. If you think that we have not only to continue to produce what we are producing, but we're going to have another 2.5 billion of people that need to be fed. And I come back to my first chart. Yes, for a big part of the population, we have enough calories. But there are still about 1 billion of people out there who are living like we were living in, two, in, in 1800, okay? which do not have enough calories. And we also have to get them to the level that they get sufficient calories. So this is a big challenge. Why I'm saying it's not sustainable? Because our agricultural system demands too much resources. We are living on about four planets today when it comes to agriculture. We are using the resources, sustainable resources of about four planets. And this cannot go on. Uh, the most important resource is water. And agriculture uses about 90% of all water that is being used by humankind. It withdraws more than 70%, but it uses over 90%. Because, for example, energy, which withdraws about 15%, gives big part of this water back afterwards. So if you have a hydraulic dam and, 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 and the water comes down, and, and uh, use, uh, moves the turbines, it can, gets afterwards back. Agriculture doesn't give it back. So this is one of the biggest issues. We are today uh, withdrawing about 30% more water than what is sustainable. And we withdraw it basically from the underground reservoirs which we have. And those underground reservoirs are, are going down in an alarming, alarming manner. If you take Beijing, the underground water level was about 1.5 meter when uh, Beijing started with the economic uh, revolution, one can say. Today it's more than 100 meter. Same thing in, China, uh, the same thing in India, if you go into the Punjab. Uh, when we started our first factory in the Punjab, the water level was exactly 1.5 meter. Today we had 105 meter. Which, which leads you to come down to the arsenic level of the underground, which is coming from the Himalayas. So you're getting more and more contaminated water. Bangladesh, the same thing. 30% of the Bangladesh population today is arsenically poisoned already. That's why you see Bangladesh people with these black tubs. So this is our biggest problem that we have. And I have become famous saying, yes, I know climate change is important, but I know one thing, Water is much more important and much more urgent because water is a problem of today. It's not a problem of in 100 years or something like this. Okay? So this is the biggest issue in, in that we have in agriculture. Now, you were mentioning organic. Well, unfortunately, organic is not using less resources. It uses more resources. Okay? So organic alone cannot be the solution. Organic is a great solution for countries like Switzerland, Austria, which have a limited amount of people to feed. They have sufficient resources, especially water resources available, but it's not an answer to the big challenge of how to, f how to feed 10 billion of people. It's not, unfortunately not. It will always be the privilege for those people who, are, who can and have the money to pay something more because it's more resource intensive and therefore it has little, uh, less yield and therefore it's more, exp it's, it's more expensive. Now, aquaculture is a different story. Aquaculture, you mentioned aquaculture, and, uh, I think. Aquaculture, of course, is, I think, today uh, the way how we will uh, assure that we will have fish supply in the future. Because as you know very well, our oceans are basically overfished already by now. And there is no way that we will get uh, uh, there an equilibrium also between natural fish supply and, uh, for example, the demand for proteins that we have coming from the oceans. Uh, very clearly, you can see that in one area, which is, uh, for example, uh, the sturgeon, 
The sturgeon uh, has become an endangered species by overfishing in the Caspian Sea, and today more than 80% of all caviar production is done in aquaculture because there is the, the, the natural one that is sim simply uh, not anymore here. So, very relevant question, difficult answers. I, I, the answers were on uh, partially on, on uh, genetically modified uh, plants. This has found its emotional barrier uh, that uh, consumers, especially in Europe, but also increasingly in the United States, don't want to have them, although there is, frankly speaking, uh, scientifically absolutely no reason to be against it, but that's emotional. I think you will find in the area of Precision, uh, precision agriculture. This will be a very important part, and there are a lot of, of new startups in this area. And the second area is going to be the microbiomes, uh, not only we, I talked before very shortly about our microbiomes, but plants also have a microbiome, very important one. And by in, in increasing and fertilizing the microbiomes of plants, you might be able to increase uh, they yield to 15%, 20%. So I think precision, precision agriculture and microbiomes for plants are going to be two or three areas where we can improve. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I have prepared some uh, statistics and some data which I wanted to share after the presentation, if it's possible. Of course, we can talk afterwards. Thank you. There was a question down here. No, there's one here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> my name is Diego. I'm from Venezuela. I'm an international relations student. So my question is basically related to the field of study I'm in. So it has two sides of the question. First is water. Um, so Nestle is the largest uh, water producer in the world, if I'm not mistaken. And I wanted to ask how does Nestle engages in humanitarian assistance uh, programs uh, with the UN or other international organizations to assist countries that have 55% uh, of lack to accessibility of water, such as Somalia in Africa or Eritrea or countries in the West and Eastern Africa especially that have this kind of problems. And uh, my second side of the question is also how Nestle deals with the palm oil sourcing, since it's being, it's being linked uh, several times with Wilmar. With Wilmar. It's a company that uh, provides uh, palm oil. and. Um, the rainforest uh, destruction in Indonesia. So how does, uh, this, is, this has been claimed by Greenpeace, by the way, how does Nestle this with this uh, with these claims? And uh, to finish the question, also wanted to ask if Nestle does not engage in these kinds of activities, how does it promote health based on prevention? If, uh, for example, in the US, I think you said that GDP uh, the, or healthcare assistance uh, had a big part of GDP, but if it's a better idea, maybe like Trump is, um, uh, the new President Donald Trump is um, uh, uh, suggesting right now, that it's probably better to in increase the, the defense spent rather than healthcare and uh, health prevention spent, and also environmental protection. So thank you very much for receiving my question. Well, uh I think I will, I, will, I will refrain from answering the question uh, why the new elected president puts more money into defense and takes it away, by the way, not only from, uh, from the health budget, he takes it away also from well. his diplomatic budget. If you look, 30% uh, of the state secretariat has to be uh, brought down. So I think he has been talking to these private equity guys and uh, have said we are doing a brutal restructuring so that we can spend more. So I, I don't, that's a political issue. I'm not going to talk about this one. The question you were, you were asking and, and uh, was about water and what Nestle is doing. First of all, let me get it right. Uh, we are not uh, the biggest company involved in water, by far not, because we are not involved in uh, tap water, drinking water, <coughs> irrigation water, and all these things, which are the big part of the water. We are only involved in bottled water. Now, in bottled water, it's true, we are the world-leading bottled water company. 
And uh, just to give you an idea, uh, we are using for all the bottled water that we are producing all over the world, okay, we are using 0 0.0009% of the water that is withdrawn. Okay? So even, even if you would prohibit Nestle to produce bottled water, you wouldn't solve absolutely anything. You would only cause major problems because, as you were rightly pointing out, it's quite interesting. Whenever you have a catastrophic issue, the first thing that people need is bottled water. If you think about Haiti, when there was a bit, or any, any uh, earthquake, what's the first thing the government has to bring to the population? It's bottled water. Okay? Even more ironic, if you have a big flood, which is you have too much water, what do you need? Bottled water. The first thing you need. So don't forget that in spite of all, bottled water is a source for the people. I have, of course, certainly read about us uh, producing bottled water in California when there was a drought, okay? And I talked to the governor, I said, Governor, can you explain to me that when our bottled water factory is producing water which is for, for whom? For people. And you have an issue with that, but you have no issue that just outside of our, of our factories. They are watering the golf course and they're using more water to water the golf course than we are using in order to produce bottled water for the people who need something to drink. Okay? So I, I, I don't get this quite clear, this, this thing, because it's all an emotional issue. It has nothing to do with the reality. Now, are we using? Yes, we were in Haiti. Yes, we are in Eritrea. Yes, we are in Sudan even now, helping people with bottled water. But we are also doing, together with the UNHCR, we have established uh, in the refugee camps uh, tap water installations for the, for the refugee. Not as a business. This is not our business. This is part of our social responsibility. We have also established that every one of our uh, factories, water factories, there is always minimum two wells which are accessible for the population which is living around free of charge. I mean, this was when you went to Vitell or you went to even here, you go to, uh, to Enye or wherever you go. Normally, you always have access to free water when you go to the source. And the same thing we are doing with all our water factories. So in Pakistan, for example, we have uh, a factory and we have two villages, 10,000 people, that take their water from our factory free of charge. They have access to, this, uh, to, to these wells. In India, we have, in all schools which are around our factories, we have installed uh, uh, wells and, and fountains for the children. So yes, we are very much active in this area. The last question was about palm oil. Uh, palm oil, we are a consumer of palm oil. We are a relative small consumer. We consume about 320,000 tons of palm oil, which is a small drop in the ocean, uh, because we are not in the margarine business. We are not in the fat and oil business, so that's why it is not so big for us. But we are. Uh, we have together with, we have worked together with Greenpeace. We have uh, a, a a joint venture, you wouldn't call it a joint venture, we, have an, we are working together with cooperation with, with Greenpeace, and uh, we are only acquiring uh, sustainable and fair trade uh, palm oil, and this is being uh, checked and uh, controlled by the, by the Rainforest uh, Association. This is the NGO partner that we have. Thank you very much. There are some questions on this side. Um, hello, my name is Roshni. Um, I wanted to ask you related to food wastage. 
Um, as much as you say that there is a need to increase food production, at the same time, food wastage is on a very steady rise. So I just wanted to ask you that from coming from a food industry point of view, how do you think, what's, what do you think is the best way of balancing the two in, in terms of increasing food production, but at the same time ensuring that food wastage is controlled? And um, just to add on to that, I, I personally come from Africa, and um, as much as we see like the first world countries in terms of, this, of, of the states is where food, uh, food wastage is much more and production is needed more in Africa. But there's that difference. It's not, it's not being produced where it's needed and wastage is not reduced where it needs to be. So how do you think uh, the food industry tries to balance between this? Thank you. Yeah, a very, very, very important question. Uh, because it, it also has to do with the water issue that we just talked before. Uh, food wastage is about 40% of all the food which is being produced is being thrown away. And that's again part of the unsustainability of our, of our system. Okay? Now, if you are from Africa, you will lose about 40% of all food produced because there is no infrastructure, because there is no or not sufficient food industry, so that exactly what happened before when we had in 1800 when, when, when the fresh food was brought to the city by the time it arrives in the city it's already rotten so that's where we're losing it and in, in Europe in the, in, the, in the more developed part of it we throw it away at home okay it's absolutely fascinating to see uh, that about uh, the figures in the UK were about 38% of all food that is being bought we're not only talking about this one which is being thrown away by the supermarkets because nobody buys it anymore. The one that has been bought has been thrown away. Okay? So this is a huge issue. Why I said it has also to do with, with, uh, with um, water. If you take into consideration that uh, you need five to six liters of water for your hydration okay, in order to be able to live, you are eating, if you are vegetarian, about 2,000 liters per day. And if you are Texans, you are eating about 6,500 liters of water per day. Because we need one liter of water to produce one calorie if it comes from a plant. We need 10 liters of water to produce a calorie when it comes from animals. So when you have a 500 gram steak, you are a huge water, uh, water user. And when you are more a vegetarian, you are, you are, you are a smaller water user, but, but anyway. So if we, got the, if we can get the grip on the 40% of food vestige, we would have solved our water problem of the world. That would be the most efficient way to solve the water problem is to avoid that we have food wastage. And this is the link which I wanted to point out. So we are working on that very clearly. We have uh, programs that is zero waste. We do it not only alone, we also do it together with our partners uh, from the retail side, because nobody alone can do it. And we are working on it. Uh, are we a successful? I would say half and half. Uh, I think we have been able to diminish waste. For example, we have today f factories where we have zero uh, waste factories. Not all of them already, but we have several of them. But this doesn't mean because we don't have a waste that then afterwards in the whole food chain there is no waste. So there's still a lot to be done. But this is going to be one of the most important challenges that we have in order to become less resource intensive. Uh, the microphone is behind, so I'm... Thank you. Um, a couple of years ago, you um, gave a talk about how Nestle was inclined toward water privatization. And I quote you. you can said, you... Uh, can you can, wait, wait. I was what? Uh, that you were inclined to, to talk about the water privatization and how Nestle could act on it. And if I may, I can quote you. Yeah. Uh, there are two different opinions in the matter of water. The one opinion which I think is extreme is represented by the NGOs who bang about declaring water a public right. That means that as a human being, you should have a right to water. That is an extreme solution. 
So what are your views today on um, water privatization and uh, a human right for water? Thank you. Uh, if, you if you would uh, not only take this one quote, but you would take the whole speech, you would see, and it is, you just go on, if you go to the internet, you just go on on the next step, and then you will see the answer which I gave to this part of it, which was an interpretation cut out of, of a full sentence, okay? I repeat what I say again, what I said also at that time. Water is a human right. And you will be surprised. It was me 10 years ago who convinced Kofi Annan in Davos that water should be declared to be a human right. Okay? And it was only about 10 years ago that the UN declared water a human right. Before it was not. But let me be very clear. For me, it's a human right. The 1.5% of the water withdrawal that we need in order to assure that everybody on this earth has access to 25 to 30 liters of water. Five liters for hydration, 25 liters for minimum hygiene. That's a human right. And it's up to governments to assure that this human right is being granted to everybody on earth. Okay? That's my interpretation. And I say again, I don't think it's a human right to fill your or my swimming pool. I don't think it's a human right to water the golf courses and to use the resources for that. I don't think it's a human right that, you do it, that the water which you're using for, for your, to wash your cars to have it nice and proper. That's what I'm saying it's not a human right. And I still say it. I believe that the 1.5% is a human right that we need, that we need to live. But not the other 98.5% that we are using in an irresponsible manner because we do not give any value to water. That's exactly what I said, and I repeat it, and I stay for that. I have never said... <laughs> and talking about privatization, I have always said, and you can go through any of my speeches, that it doesn't matter whether the public water, the public water is privatized or not privatized because both systems have proven to be deficitary. I can tell you the privatization of London has not helped that the efficiency of the London water tap, tap, tap water is better. 35% of the water in London is being lost due to leakages because it, the, the infrastructure is not, is not being taken care of. If you privatize, you don't privatize, this problem has not been solved, okay? So I have never said neither you should privatize nor you should not. Both systems have failed to assure us that we have efficient water infrastructure. That's my, my, my opinion on privatization. Okay, anything else? There were some questions here and so over there. Who is running the microphone? Um, hello, thank you for coming. My name is Daryl. Um, since you mentioned it right after my friend Diego's question, uh, I watched one of your interviews last year, I believe, when you said you felt a social responsibility by providing over 270,000 people with jobs. But then again, on the very same interview, you said you were amazed by the high-tech, the highly robotized factories in Japan which I believe um, is going to be just a matter of time for Nestle. So my question is, when it comes to that, how do you plan to um, balance the social responsibility between the highly robotized future with nearly no workers and your labor? Um, that's, that's, I think, one of the most critical issues that we have today. And when I'm uh, in the Silicon Valley up there, I have some heated discussions and, uh, and debates uh, about this subject. Uh, there is no doubt that the fourth industrial revolution, uh, as I mentioned it in my speech, uh, is going to have an enormous impact on our social network. I mean, the way, the way how we are, we are working with each other. Now, um, 
there has always been. That's the answer that that those gentlemen out there, ladies out there, and the valet give me. Ah, you shouldn't worry about this because you know uh, that happened also in the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution. But at the end of the day, we always have been creating more jobs. Uh, in the in the longer run, it will only will be different jobs. Well, uh, uh, my answer to this was. Uh, I think this time it's different. I'm sorry. I know we are going to destroy and I know we are going to create some new some new jobs. But I think that the, the time, the in-between in period, is going to be very long. So it's not going to be that in one generation, during one generation, we are going to create the jobs that we are destroying at this same time of the generation. And that is going to be the, the, the enormous challenge that we are going to have. If you think about something which is basically at our door, just think about the driverless car. Okay? If you look into the American, into, into the American uh, economy, the number one job, number one job in all of the United States is driver. Okay, whether it's truck driver, whether it's taxi driver, Uber driver, whatever, drivers. That's the biggest job they have. In five years, they can all be jobless. And what I'm saying, I don't know how we are going to get a job for those people. No idea. And I think we will have to start to think about it. I think this is one of the reasons why I have in another opportunity I was talking I was invited by the 30 deans of the most important universities to talk with them. And I said, you know, uh, I understand that uh, in your curriculum, you're pushing more and more into technology and all this part of it. But I said, but I just want to draw the attention that you should not forget about the whole humanistic side because the answer to this question can only come from the humanistic side. And this today, nobody cares about. And when I mentioned in my speech just before another subject, which I think is very, very serious, I mean, we, didn't, we don't have time to go, to go into it, but I am deeply worried about what it's going to, be, to, mean, uh, to, to, to mean to be a human. Because I can think of a lot of instances that are already here, okay, that will put a question to this. Where are we stopping to be a human being? And then you come, in order not to, to come back to your question, if you have a society where you are what you do, and that's the society we are today. The biggest issue in Spain of unemployment was not the economic one. The biggest issue in Spain of unemployment was that if you don't have a job, you are nothing. And if you have a generation that is 55% unemployed and they are nothing, well, the answer is very simple. It's Podemos, no? It's very clear. You see, those challenges that will come, which we have lived here on a small scale, this will come. These challenges, Mr. Trump, for example, has not taken in consideration at all. It's fantastic to think that in a country like in the United States, somebody can be elected president by trying to find the solution of the future by going backwards into the past. Okay. I think there were more people lower down here. I think because you are favoring the upper grades and then some people here. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine. If you, but I think there were some in the... Okay. Any question here on this side? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Brabeck. I'm Isabel Bali, a member of the faculty of European University. 
And I have read in the past in the newspapers, I have heard in the news, that they are now trying to produce artificial food. For example, artificial meat to substitute and to be able to feed the whole world population. I would like to know what you think about that. What would be the effect on humans in the future with all these artificial things? Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether artificial is the right, is, 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 is the right uh, name to it. What it is, it's a meat substitute based on proteins. That's what it is. If you sell it at meat, then, then you have to say it's artificial meat because it's, of course, not meat. It's a protein based that has a texture which has an organoleptical uh, behavior like a meat. This is nothing new. ICC uh, in, in, in the UK produced the first meat substitute 19, must have been 1975, 1976. That's the first time I came about it. Nestle has uh, two major factories where we're producing uh, vegetable uh, food. Uh, basically, you can have Wiener Schnitzel, you can have uh, uh, chicken or chicken meat, which is plant protein, uh, etc., for vegetarians and things like this. Uh, the, I think the, 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 the artificial one is, because we call it meat, so that's the only thing. I think uh, pro, uh, plant protein, is, as I mentioned before, uh, a plant protein needs about a one tenth of the resources of a meat pro of a meat one. So I think we will have to look for more plant protein. You have this very clearly in the United States now, for example, by uh, plant pr uh, protein beverages. There are many people they don't drink milk anymore, so they have almond milk, silk milk. Uh, um, <laughs> Oh, not silk milk, um, soy milk, of course. <laughs> the company is called Silk, that's why I got confused. So, soy milk, etc., etc. We have peanut milk. Our, our biggest business in, in China is a peanut milk business, okay? Uh, and it is from a resource. It is one answer to, 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 to bring the resource utilization down. So I think this is something which, which will uh, develop even further and, and relatively fast. Uh, it comes climate change to this stuff uh, additionally because if you think about uh, especially cattle, but all animal breeding is uh, from a climate change point of view uh, as damaging as all the cars in the world. So uh, the 200, 240 million cows the methane output, which is 20 times more intensive than the CO2 on climate change. Uh, that's another issue. But, but I, I think more importantly for me is just take this one thing what I said before. One liter of water, one calorie coming from a plant, 10 liters of water if it, the same calorie comes from an animal. So that's, that's the answer. You have mentioned so many names that I all forgot them already. What was the question? No, I just wanted to know what the question is. I mean, huh? Yeah, so what do you, what do you think of the people who are concerned about genetically modified 
Oh, who, are, who are worried about genetically modified food? No, I get that was the first question you had before. That's okay. Uh, I give you an answer to this thing, first of all. Uh, up to now, uh, there has been not one single case in the whole world that anybody has fallen sick, has been poisoned, forget about, has been dying from genetically modified food. None, no. not even, not even, ask, ask, no, ask, ask uh, Greenpeace, who is the biggest fight against GMO, and they will recognize that this is not a safety issue. They were putting it forward as a safety issue. And I will give you a very good example how they put it forward. There was this famous, I don't know whether you had it in, on your list, there was this famous scientist uh, and professor at Edinburgh University, okay? when Tony Blair was saying he would allow GMO in, in, in the UK. And then he made his test with mice, and he gave the mice potato. And they were GMO potatoes. And the mice developed cancer. And he came on the press, first page, okay? GMO potato produces cancer. And of course, with that, there was a huge outcry how Tony Blair could ever think about authorizing GMO, okay? Now, had this nice doctor been feeding normal potato to these mice, they would have had exactly the same cancer. Because if you listen to my uh, speech before, if you eat raw potatoes, you're poisoned and you will get cancer. If you don't cook them, and the guy didn't cook them, he just took a GMO potato, didn't cook them, gave them to the mice, and the mice developed cancer. Okay? This is part of the science which is behind, you know, saying it is dangerous. Even Greenpeace had to give up on this one. Greenpeace today is, is against GMO, not because of the safety issue. It's against GMO because of the diversity issue, which is a different story. They are saying, I am against it because a GMO product does not reproduce itself. And therefore, they're against it. And this is an argument which I must say, I have more understanding about it, okay? So this is the difference. It's not a safety issue. And this is while I'm, what I was saying all my life. It's not a safety issue. You are, it's not a quality issue. If you make an analysis of the quality of a GMO product or the quality of a non-GMO product or the quality of an organic product, the nutritional quality is exactly the same. And therefore, we have always said we are not against a new technology that can help to increase the yield of agriculture by 15 to 20 percent. I think it is wrong. Now, we respect the opinion of our consumers and where the consumer doesn't want it, we don't produce GMO products like we don't do in Europe. But I also want just to tell you an anecdote. I was advisor of the Austrian Chancellor and Austria is the most, the country which is most violently against GMO, okay? And I told my Chancellor, I said, look, if you are serious, if you are really worried about the health of your people, because that was at the time he told me, he said, you would have to do what you are demanding on the tobacco industry. Everybody who buys a ticket to the United States, there should be a big warning step of, on top of it, which says you are going to a country where you're going to eat GMO product, which is putting the life, your life and the life of the children into danger, okay? Which of course nobody does because it's not true. We are not fighting against GMO labeling. We are not fighting against GMO labeling. We are doing GMO labeling. And if you look at the Nestle product, you will find that we have them labeled GMO. We are not fighting it. I have no problem to be, to be open and transparent. That's the most important thing that the food industry can do, being open and transparent. Okay, I don't know how much time we have. I mean, I can, I can go on. I mean, I'm, I'm at ease, but I don't know about the organizers. I think we go for a break because a normal professor at European University, EU Business School, yeah. he has 15 minutes and you are near retirement. <laughs>
<laughs> and you have the vitality of a young young man who wants to make a career with Nestle. And uh, I go over now to close this discussion. You can always continue to push all, to put all your questions over to Peter Brabic. And he has not only one or two or three uh, employees working on these strategic issues, but every one of us will receive an answer of it. So thank you, Peter, to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The continuation of the program, I let it in the hands of uh, Susanna or Jimenez. So please give us your comments. Uh, the program will continue in the corridor outside. We have a cocktail prepared for everyone, so uh, and Peter will be joining everyone outside in about five to ten minutes. Thank you.